to the fourth program in our 2024 Great Decision Series, co-sponsored by the Mead Public Library and the Sheboygan Branch of the American Association of University Women. Great Decisions is a project of the Foreign Policy Association. They research eight timely topics and publish a book with this information and also a CD and then make it available to places like the Mead Public Library. Copies of the book are available, or were available on the in the back. Are they still there? Yes, they are. Okay. <laughs> and you can also order a copy um, from the Foreign Policy Association site. AEW is a nonpartisan organization dedicated to empowering girls and women. Locally, we give scholarships to non-traditional women students. We sponsor candidate forums for the mayor, the Sheboygan School Board, and the city council. And another project of ours is the annual STEM Day for Girls. And there are some brochures on the back table, or were. Um, it's an event for sixth to ninth grade girls to get them to think about careers in science, technology, engineering, and math. Last year, we registered 86 girls. This year, our event is November 2nd, and uh, registration information is available um, on our website or Facebook. We are indebted to the work of Mead librarian Audrey Lau for her work in arranging the schedule of these programs, and to Mead library assistant Ryan Gonzalez for his help. I would also thank Scott Mieloff director of WSCS and his cameraman for taping our Great Decisions programs for viewing on WSCS. Tonight's topic, a very timely topic, Mideast Realignment, will be presented by Beth Doherty. Beth is Manager Professor of International Relations and Professor of Political Science at Beloit College. She received her MA and PhD in Foreign Affairs from the University of Virginia. Since joining the Beloit, Beloit facility in 1996, she has taught a broad range of international political courses, including U.S. foreign policy in the Middle East, the politics of mass killing, human rights, and nationalism and ethnic conflict. She has received both campus and national awards for innovative teaching. Her main research interests are transitional justice, focusing on the cases of Iraq, Sierra Leone, and Bosnia, human rights, and Iraqi politics. She will speak for about 45 minutes, after which we will have a question and answer period. We have to vacate the room by 8 o'clock. Please raise your hand if you have a question that you would like to ask, and Chris will bring you the microphone. And then I ask that you speak into the microphone so that we can all hear you. Now, please help me in welcoming Beth Doherty. <laughs> So I'd like to um, thank Sheboygan for asking me to um, come back to the library again. This is such a, a beautiful facility. Um, and other than rush hour in Milwaukee, it generally is a very nice drive to come up here from, from Beloit. Today, of course, we are simply one day past the one-year anniversary of the October 7 attacks by Hamas against Israel. It, this map is a satellite map that allows you to see the areas where um, Hamas breached the fence around Gaza to uh, infiltrate into Israeli territory. Approximately 1,200 people were killed on October 7th. Um, roughly 400 of them were Israeli security forces. The remainder were, of course, Israeli civilians. About 250 hostages were taken. Play, or were taken. Um, maybe about 100 of those hostages are still believed to be held. Uh, no one is quite sure how many of them are still alive, but um, unfortunately they think that probably dozens of them have uh, died while they have been in captivity. And of course, um, immediately following the um, October 7 attacks, um, Israel prepared to invade the Gaza Strip uh, where the attack had, had come from. It, 
At the time, um, President Joe Biden said, and he has repeated this again and again, that the U.S. has an ironclad commitment to Israel's security. Okay. Um, would note that with Gaza, Israel um, took this territory in 1967 during the uh, 1967 war. It occupied it until 2005 when it withdrew its forces. But then when Hamas was able to take control in uh, Gaza in 2006, 2007, Israel imposed a total blockade of the territory. Um, so it continued to control um, its borders, both uh, land, air, and, and sea. So Israel has long been seen, um, as you know, as a major U.S. ally. There's like two basic categories of reasons why um, Israel is largely seen as a, such an important ally of the United States. The first one is strategic. Right? The argument is that the Middle East itself is uh, critical to U.S. security and that Israel helps the United States to preserve peace and stability in the region. Right? The primary American interest in this area during the Cold War was, of course, to prevent the Soviet Union from um, gaining any additional footholds. After 1979, American containment policy was mainly focused at containing um, the fundamentalism that was coming from the um, Islamic Republic in Iran. Another one of the major reasons why the U.S. Um, sees the Middle East as a strategic area um, is because of it is committed to the free flow of oil out of the Persian Gulf, right? and it wants to keep uh, the major waterways open. There are um, multiple, well, three, um, waterways that are critically important to global shipping. Right? You have the Strait of Hormuz, which is between um, uh, Iran and uh, the United Arab Emirates is an incredibly narrow area. The shipping lanes are only about a mile or two wide um, in each uh, direction, uh, but a significant portion of the world's oil and natural gas comes through the Strait of Hormuz on a daily basis. Um, then you have the Babd al-Mandab Strait, which is, um, let's see, can I do that? How do I? Huh. There we are between um, Yemen and Djibouti. The Houthis, of course, control this part of Yemen. The Houthis are an Iranian-backed militia. Um, and so the, a number of months ago, that was where all the attention was paid in terms of making sure that we had the uh, free flow of oil and uh, strategic waterways that were kept open. And then the last major US interest um, uh, is to combat terrorism in the region. And of course, with that, um, the United States has a clear partner in Israel. It, Israel has a very powerful military um, and intelligence services, which the United States believes helps it to deter our enemies. It, that's the second um, big piece of this. The U.S. and the Israelis share common enemies, right? Mainly um, the Islamic Republic of Iran, and then all of the proxies that the Iranians have. Um, it's allied with the government in Iraq, but you also have Iraqi militias that are beholden to Tehran. The government in Syria, which is um, beholden to Tehran, Hezbollah in Lebanon, um, Hamas in Gaza, and now the Houthis in Yemen. Yep. Um, and thirdly, there is a very, there are, I mean, decades worth of cooperation, intelligence sharing, joint exercises, and the sharing of technology between Israel and the United States. For example, um, Israel had developed uh, armor plating on vehicles to help them against uh, improvised explosive devices, which the United States actually uh, bought from the Israelis to armor plate the vehicles the U.S. was using in Afghanistan. It, and they have cooperated in um, some extensive technological um, advances, namely the missile defense systems that the Israelis um, use to ensure that missiles shot towards its territory don't actually hit the ground. In, so those are the strategic arguments behind this. On the um, sort of on the cultural and moral side, the argument has always been that Israel is the only democracy in the Middle East, um, that Israel has a right to exist and is deserving of American protection. It, um, there is a narrative uh, in the United States around sort of like 
both of Israel as an underdog, but also at the same time as, as um, a country that should be admired for its achievements and for the strength and daring of its military and its intelligence forces. And then lastly, one of the chief sources of support for Israel in the United States actually comes from evangelical Christians who have a religious reason for believing that um, Jews should be in control of the Holy Land. I would remind you, there's only about 2% of the U.S. population is Jewish, so obviously that cannot be the main reason why this is so important in U.S. domestic politics. Evangelicals are a much, much larger share of the population. Um, the other uh, area where you've got a lot of support for Israel domestically in the United States um, comes from the defense industries because the U.S. sells so much weaponry to Israel. So U.S. really only started massively arming Israel after the 1973 Arab-Israeli War. Right. Um, since the 1978 Camp David Accords, the United States has provided at least $3 billion a year to the Israelis. Um, we used to provide economic aid into the early 2000s, but I mean, Israel's um, gross domestic product is, is on par with a Western industrialized country. It doesn't need economic assistance from the United States, so that was phased out. The amount that the United States is giving to, um, I don't know what happened there. The, um, the computer is turning itself off. <laughs> um, but anyway, um, the United States is now providing um, about $3.8 billion a year for the, um, to the Israelis it's okay. um, because of the fact that we are giving them hundreds of thousands, or no, hundreds of millions of dollars um, to help with the missile defense things like the Iron Dome system. Okay. Um, Israel is by far uh, the largest recipient of U.S. Uh, military aid since 1946. I mean, by far. About 60% of all the foreign military funds the U.S. has available actually go to Israel. And since 1999, the United States has been signing 10-year um, memorandums of agreement with uh, the Israelis. So we commit 10 years in advance to 10 years worth of funding for, um, for Israel. The Israelis also get all kinds of privileges because of a principle the United States calls the qualitative military edge. So it's written into U.S. law that the United States must ensure that Israel maintains um, a qualitative military edge over anybody else in the region. So that means things like the Israelis get... Um, the best weapon systems that the United States have. They get them earlier than anybody else. It, um, if the United States is going to supply, uh, say, Saudi Arabia with um, AWACS planes, Israel is going to also get something um, to make sure that the qualitative military edge um, has not eroded. Okay. Um, as I mentioned, since 2010, the U.S. has given um, Israel hundreds of millions of dollars. It's about a half a billion dollars a year to help with things like the Iron Dome system, uh, which deployed in 2011. Okay. And so the United States um, has also, uh, since the war started, it approved an additional $14.3 billion in aid to the Israelis. Um, and USAID has spent approximately a billion dollars so far um, providing humanitarian aid into the region to help deal with the humanitarian consequences of the war against Gaza. Okay. U.S. has also, um, of course, been helping uh, Israel diplomatically at the United Nations, and it um, participated in helping Israel protect itself against the two major Iranian missile strikes against Israel, one in April um, and one that just happened um, a few days ago. Okay. So despite these close ties, despite um, everything that the United States has, has been doing for, um, for Israel, the relationship is clearly very troubled. Right. Um, U.S. support for Israel is actually damaging U.S.'s global standing, and it's eroding U.S. power. It may also be leading the United States into a wider regional war. There are multiple tensions, right? and there are um, kind of three categories that I, I want to look at. One is asking, what is Israel's end game in terms of the war in Gaza and now the war in Lebanon? 
The second one has to do with the um, high number of civilian casualties and the accompanying humanitarian catastrophe. Right? And then the third piece is thinking about um, the degree to which Israel has repeatedly rebuffed American efforts uh, to negotiate ceasefires, humanitarian access, um, et cetera. Right? So one of the first questions you really have to ask, and this is something the United States has been asking Israel from the very beginning, what is the end game? Right? Um, the Biden administration um, has tried to counsel Israel as a friend, tried to suggest that the US had some experience with this, that Israel should learn from the lessons that the United States learned in Iraq and Afghanistan, You know, don't make those mistakes. They tried to um, uh, talk Israel into going in, for a counterterrorism operation in Gaza rather than an actual full-fledged military invasion. I will note there are reports that the Biden administration did talk Israel out of attacking Lebanon on October 11th. So four days after the attack, the Israelis were ready to go and, and the Americans said, Don't, if, you, if you go to Lebanon, we're not going with you. Right? So there was some restraint in that um, uh, piece. But the Israelis have really maximalist um, intentions here. Um, their, their goal is the destruction of Hamas's military and governing capabilities to ensure that another attack can never take place from Gaza. Unfortunately, violence has not been successful in the past in helping to secure Israel's security woes. At best, it has always only purchased Israel a couple of years, res respite, and then we are back into this cycle of violence. There have been multiple wars in Gaza over the last um, uh, 20 years, right? In Israel, they call it mowing the grass. Every once in a while, you have to go into Gaza and mow the grass to keep everything under control. But there have been wars in, um, in oops, wrong way, this thing. Yeah. So in 2008, this is Operation Cast Lead, right? Um, then again, um, in 2012, in 2014, and this is actually, it says present, but that was um, the Great March of Return. So this was taking place in 2021. So what we have right now is actually the fifth major conflict between Israel um, and Gaza since 2008. These conflicts have resulted in widespread destruction and loss of life. Um, you can see here that the casualties have always been extraordinarily disproportionate between Israel and the Palestinians. Not only does that open Israel up to widespread international condemnation, it also stokes Palestinian anger towards the Israelis. Ultimately, of course, that probably was helping Hamas. It distracted people's attention from the incredibly bad governing record that Hamas had in the Gaza Strip. Um, and it meant that Hamas was able to attract additional recruits from a younger generation whose only experience of Israel has been violence um, and death. It, there have also been multiple wars in Lebanon. Just Israel invaded Lebanon in 1978. Again, in 1982, and by the way, it is in direct response to that 1982 invasion that Hezbollah was formed. It, after the 1982 invasion, the Israelis occupied a significant portion of southern Lebanon between 1985 and 2000. Um, they were finally forced to withdraw. Hezbollah took credit for that victory. It's one of the things that gave Hezbollah legitimacy in, in Lebanon. There was an, a massive uh, conflict in 2006 between Israel and Hezbollah, and they seem to have reached, um, at that point, an, equal, an equilibrium where each side understood if they used too much force, they were going to tip the whole thing into another war, and neither side appeared to be interested in a full-fledged um, conflict conflagration um, from that point, right? But the violence that we are seeing now is orders of magnitude worse than what we have seen in any of these earlier um, areas. The violence is not going to change the underlying dynamic of what is happening in the Middle East, and that is the lack of a political solution to the plight of the Palestinian people. Since 1967, when Israel occupied the Gaza Strip, the West Bank, uh, the Sinai Peninsula, East Jerusalem, and the Golan Heights. Right? Um, it returned Sinai. It annexed the Golan Heights. Um, 
It remains in control of East Jerusalem and the West Bank, and of course, it completely controls the borders around, um, around Gaza. But since that point, the two-state solution has been what the international community, what the United States, et cetera, that everyone has pushed for, that there should be an independent Palestinian state but the Israelis have consistently pursued policies that try to push that eventuality further and further out into the future, what Israel called creating facts on the ground so that they would not have to give up the territory that it had taken in 1967. Current Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu um, is on record as opposing the creation of a Palestinian state. It has been one of the chief uh, goals of his administration is preventing that from emerging. It, the current government um, in Israel includes some very radical religious Zionists who um, have a belief religiously that Israel should control the whole land of Israel, and by that they mean everything between um, uh, the Mediterranean Sea and the Jordan River. It, um, and so as a result of this, over time, I mean, it started under the first the Israelis' labor governments, but then it really takes off um, in the late 1970s when Likud comes, Likud governments come into power. But the building of Israeli settlements in the occupied territories, right? Israel did have settlements in Gaza, but they were dismantled in 2005 when it um, when it withdrew. But you can imagine from a Palestinian perspective, what they see is Israel swallowing ever more of their land. Um, this is a map of the, um, uh, the Oslo Accords, right? And you can see in the, um, the pale green and the pale yellow, those are the areas that the Palestinians are supposed to control, right? This is just an archipelago. They barely can, um, can get between one or the other because of the restrictions that Israel has, has placed in the, um, in the West Bank. This does not go away no matter what happens in, in Gaza. This still will have to be addressed at some point by um, the Israeli government. But they have immensely complicated this situation because they have imported so many settlers into these areas. I would note settlers come in, in, in kind of three categories. Um, one, you have hardcore religious Zionists right, who have a religious and an ideological um, reason for wanting to settle all of the land. Then you have um, uh, Haredi settlers. These are uh, members of the ultra-Orthodox community in Israel. They are not Zionists, right? So they want to live separate from secular Israeli society. They need um, apartments and um, decent housing because they have very large families between six and seven children on average because a Haredi population um, also has a high unemployment rate. Um, these families tend to be impoverished, so they're looking for some place they can go to get away from secular Israeli society where they can have a decent standard of living. So you have significant numbers of Haredi settlers um, that have gone. And then you just have ordinary Israelis who are just looking for um, uh, you know, bedroom communities, someplace nice where they can commute into Tel Aviv or into, um, into Jerusalem, who don't really have any kind of real ideological motivation for why they have moved into the settlement. But they have kind of erased from their mind the so-called green line, right? The boundary between the West Bank and Israel. And so for most Israelis, crossing the green line has no meaning. They, it just, it doesn't matter which side of it they're on. It's the same for them. For Palestinians, the green line is the mark over which they cannot cross from there over into, into Israel. Right. And so the settlement issue um, has been getting even worse. So these numbers are from the um, Israeli organization Peace Now. This is the number of housing starts. So new housing units that have been built in settlements um, starting in 2012. So the Israelis have not built any new settlements. They just expand them. Right? They, they get bigger and bigger, and they add, are adding housing units, and that's why the number of settlers has gone up. 
You also have outposts. Even the Israeli government views outposts as illegal. Um, these are usually, um, these are the religious Zionists, the very ideological settlers who are trying to ensure that they can um, control ever more uh, of the land in the West Bank. The Israeli government, though, um, recently has been legalizing a number of the outposts. And even when they're illegal and the government says, well, we didn't want them to be there, ultimately what tends to happen is um, the government actually connects them to the electricity grid, connects them to the water grid, and then it's going to pave them a road so they can get from their trailers out to the, um, the road. So they get all kinds of help, even though technically they are illegal. Right? All of these are an obstacle to a two-state solution. Right? And so the political crisis that is driving so much of the violence ultimately comes back to this question. What happens to the West Bank and the Gaza Strip? What happens to all of the Israeli settlers who have moved on to this territory? Right? And again, this movement of your own civilian population into occupied territory is unequivocally illegal under international law. Um, and so there are all sorts of, of uh, clever ideas people have come up with to try to figure out if there was going to be a two-state solution, how you might solve this. But my point is largely that this is really what is driving so much of the violence, the lack of this political solution. And there is um, no sign that Netanyahu's government has any kind of plan to address this. If anything, Netanyahu and his coalition partners want to prevent having to make any kind of concessions on a two-state solution. Because of the prolonged and grinding nature of Israel's occupation, I would note, I mean, 1967, this is nearly 60 years ago that people have been living under um, Israeli occupation. It, it has led Israeli and international um, human rights groups to refer to the current situation as apartheid. So they're not talking about the situation for um, uh, Israeli Palestinians, so the Arabs within Israel who have citizenship. What they are talking about is the disparity between Israeli citizens and the people that are living in the occupied territories. Um, if you look on the websites of any of the major um, Israeli NGOs like Bet Salem or Peace Now, you will see that they have, are also using the language of apartheid. I would just note, whether you agree with the idea that what Israel is, is doing and these methods um, actually add up to the crime against humanity of apartheid, it doesn't undercut the significance of this because so many people and so many countries in the international community do believe that this qualifies as apartheid. It's one of the reasons why Israel remains so isolated at the international level, and it is a prime explanation for why we have seen this massive generational switch in the United States. Right? More or less everybody who's under the age of 30, their sympathies now lie with the Palestinians and not with the Israelis. Because for younger generations, the only Israel they have ever known is the Israel of, of violence and occupation post-Intifada. Right? All of, or most of us, are old enough to remember an Israel before that. Right? But for the younger generation, when they think about Israel, this is what they think about. Right? And so Israel is, is undercutting its support in the United States, the only country where it actually enjoys significant public support because this um, political solution has not been solved. So that, that's another piece of the tensions between the, um, the US and the Israelis. A third one is there are a lot of questions about what Netanyahu's motives are for continuing um, the war. Right? So this is the current um, uh, makeup of the Israeli, uh, Israeli cabinet. We just note the religious Zionists who have um, the 14 seats here, um, they, they're very radical even um, uh, in the Israeli 
on the Israeli right wing spectrum, they would still be considered um, as radicals. They do not want Netanyahu to make any kind of concessions, right? Whether it's about the war or whether it's about um, a two state um, solution. There are. Um, there's plenty of, of speculation that what is helping to drive current Israeli policy is more about um, Netanyahu's political future and the politics of his cabinet. Right? Um, this is one of the reasons why they've set these maximalist goals. Right? So the notion that you will destroy Hamas, uh, in June, the spokesperson for the Israeli Defense Forces said publicly that is not possible. And then you ended up with this very public disagreement between the Israeli Defense Forces and Netanyahu's cabinet about how they should define the victory that they are, that they are seeking. Benjamin Netanyahu's entire career has been about keeping Israel safe. But he also owns the single worst security breach in the history of Israel, right? And and the worst loss of Jewish life since the Holocaust. He understands that his administration holds responsibility for having let Israel down in the way that they did on October 7th. It is a failure of historic proportions. Eventually, there is going to be an investigation and a reckoning in Israel. But as long as the fighting is going on, the reckoning is going to be put off. Netanyahu um, and his cabinet are hoping that if they have major victories, they will be able to repair some of the damage to um, their legacy. They might be able to restore at least some sense of security amongst Israel's population, some restore some of the lost faith of the Israeli population that their government actually is capable of securing them. And they're hoping that um, through the use of maximalist violence, they can reestablish deterrence with their enemies like Hezbollah um, and Iran specifically. Another part of this is um, Benjamin Netanyahu um, is um, facing prosecution for a corruption trial, right? As long as this war is going on and as long as he is prime minister, he does not have to face the consequences of, um, of this. And it's clear, um, because they've actually said so publicly, his um, religious Zionist coalition partners see what's happening as an opportunity to pursue their goals in the West Bank. In fact, one of the reasons some people speculate that Israel was caught so terribly off guard on October 7th is precisely because its attention was on the West Bank because of the goals of the religious Zionists who want to ensure that Israel never has to surrender this territory. It, um, most people, um, you know, because of everything else that is happening, very little attention is being paid to the West Bank, but nearly 700 Palestinians have been killed in the West Bank. Um, some of them by Israeli defense forces, but some of them by Israeli settlers who have virtual um, impunity for any sort of uh, violence that they use uh, in the West Bank. Okay. Um, Recently, the Israelis moved into um, to Janine in a counterterrorism operation, but one of the things that they did while they were there was rip up all of the streets. Right? The destruction in Janine is, uh, is unbelievable. Right? Again, you can go, I mean, all of these kinds of pictures and everything are available. The New York Times, The Guardian, et cetera, have photo essays um, about these various, um, these various things. Right? So in the administration, there is some concern. Is Netanyahu's political future helping to drive his unwillingness to accept a ceasefire, some sort of, um, of deal to end the violence um, in Gaza and now in Beirut? And I would just note that um, so, uh, the Biden was actually directly asked by a journalist just a few days ago whether or not he thought that um, Netanyahu was using the war um, as a tool to interfere in the U.S. election. Right? So, I mean, these kinds of things are, are out there. It's very clear how much tension there is between um, the Biden administration and the Netanyahu um, administration. 
The second major piece of the tension between the two of them um, has to do with the civilian casualties and the humanitarian catastrophe that has emerged in Gaza both at home amongst younger generations and um, large swaths of people in the Democratic Party, um, as well as abroad, the United States is accused of being complicit in Israel, Israel's commission of war crimes. As a matter of international humanitarian law, the United States um, very likely is guilty of complicity in war crimes. Many people outside of the United States do not understand why the United States continues to supply Israel with weapons even now after it has seen all of the, um, the consequences from this. Many people in the international community think that um, the US is being uh, hypocritical and using double standards when it criticizes Russia for actions in violation of international humanitarian law in Ukraine, but then the Americans are um, not willing to make the same criticisms of what Israel is doing in Gaza. That sort of undermining of uh, international humanitarian law and this skepticism towards the United States is a, is a bigger threat for US leadership because it's undermining key elements of the liberal international order itself, which is already under a great deal of, of stress. Right? It's also obvious to um, everyone that Israel actually isn't listening to the United States. Right? One thing I will say, there are many examples of how the Biden administration has prevented the Israelis from doing something other than what they are doing, right? But certainly in terms of saying, uh, don't invade Rafa, or um, ask, wanting them to put a ceasefire in place in Lebanon, et cetera, um, over and over again, it seems like um, Israel is not listening to the US. It's not even giving the United States um, much advance warning when it undertakes some of, the, um, some of these actions. Right? This is eroding US credibility. It makes the United States look weak. Um, and it is um, embarrassing the administration, both domestically and internationally. Right? Just note, the scale and scope of the destruction in Gaza is catastrophic. Right? We see plenty of, um, of interviews and pictures coming from Israel, right? I'm sure many of you have seen, um, you know, very moving discussions with the families of hostages or the families of young people who died at the Nova Music Festival. But what we are not seeing or hearing is anything about the suffering that is going on on the other side, right? 90%, 90% of the population of Gaza are internally displaced persons at this point, and many of them have been displaced multiple times. There is nowhere safe in Gaza for people to go. For a year, most of the population of Gaza has been in temporary shelter. Um, they have lacked food, and they have lacked safe, safety. It, this is already an incredibly densely populated area, right? But 86% of Gaza is under an evacuation order um, by the Israeli military. What this has meant is that the population has been pushed into a very small area um, along the Mediterranean. For a while um, earlier, so this is uh, Rafa province. This is where um, most of Gaza's population had originally gone, but then when Israel invaded in Rafah, all of that area then cleared out and they are now stretched out in this um, very densely populated um, uh, area. The casualties um, are massively um, disproportionate, uh, which is leading to accusations that not only is, is Israel engaging in a disproportionate um, uh, use of its weaponry, but that is also engaging in indiscriminate strikes. Right? Um, the estimate is that maybe another 10,000 people at least are probably underneath the rubble um, in Gaza. In addition to the human toll, the toll on the infrastructure has been um, absolutely devastating. According to UN satellite images, 66% of the total structures um, in Gaza are damaged or destroyed. Um, 22,591 
housing units have been damaged. So the darker the color, the more damage has been done in Gaza. This is in terms of, um, of infrastructure. Um, if anybody's interested like in the satellite stuff, it's all publicly available through the, um, through the UN and they update it pretty, um, pretty regularly. Um, this is a fairly typical picture of what it looks like in Gaza. Just the other day, the UN estimated that it will take 15 years to move the debris out of Gaza based on how long it took to move debris out in earlier wars, and 80 years, 80, to rebuild the housing that has been destroyed during the fighting. 68% of all of the um, agricultural cropland in Gaza has been damaged or destroyed. Again, these numbers are, oops, are from the UN. And so that's showing the different um, categories of things that have been damaged or destroyed and the distribution of where that is in the, um, in the Gaza Strip. This is just one picture um, from the southern portion of the Gaza Strip of what the agricultural land looks like. I would note that earlier, when people were in Rafa province, um, a lot of agricultural cropland actually became internally displaced persons camps. So people were actually living on the land. They weren't obviously then not going to be able to use it for, um, for agriculture. 68% of the road network has been damaged or destroyed in Gaza, which vastly complicates the ability um, to get humanitarian aid in. And then this has been another one of the chief tensions between the US and, um, uh, and the Israelis, which is that um, Israel has been impeding the flow of humanitarian aid into Gaza. Several, um, or much earlier um, in the conflict, uh, Israel alleged that the UN Relief and Works Agency, or UNRWA, which is the agency that deals with Palestinian refugees, that um, members of this agency uh, had participated in the um, October 7 strikes, and that there were members of Hamas that still worked for the organization. The United States and, and about 12 or 13 other countries immediately cut their funding to, um, to UNRWA. But over recent months, as the UN has done investigations, as UNRWA has put reforms into place, as it has become clear, actually, that Israel um, uh, exaggerated the extent to which Hamas had infiltrated UNRWA, everyone but the United States has um, restored its funding. But as you can see, the United States, by far, was the largest funding source for, um, for UNRWA. What the US has been doing is trying to um, funnel all of its money through the World Food Program. The problem with that is that, is that UNRWA is on the ground. They are the agency that all the other humanitarian aid agencies are saying, this is the most effective way to get humanitarian assistance um, in. Uh, assuming that um, uh, Congress comes back, they, ha they do have a bill on the docket now to restore funding for UNRWA, again, because the United States is the only one that has not done so yet. But to try to get around this, because it looks like the US is heartless for allowing this humanitarian suffering to continue, in the early part of um, the conflict, the US uh, airdropped supplies, we just note. It is really expensive to airdrop humanitarian aid supplies. It's so much cheaper to, um, to take it in by truck. This is also dangerous, um, because you could kill people when the pallets hit the ground. And there's no distribution on the other end, so it tends to set off um, uh, panicked fighting amongst people as they desperately tried to get that. When that didn't work, the administration said it was going to build the ill-fated pier. Um, this cost uh, hundreds of millions of dollars. I, I'm not even sure it was operational for 21 days um, because of the fact that the waters in the um, in the Mediterranean, there were too many waves, et cetera. They just couldn't keep the pier together. So the US has since dismantled it. Right? But the idea was that you would be able to bring aid in by sea, unload it at this floating pier, bring it onto land, load it onto trucks, and then get it out into Gaza. Um, Again, the Biden administration did this to try to, to deflect some of the criticism of its record with respect to the humanitarian situation. And since the spring, um, 
We have known that uh, Gaza is in a situation of extreme food insecurity. So um, this is a, the um, acute food insecurity analysis by the IPC. They do these for everywhere all over the world. So you know, again, any conflict you're interested in, you can find um, these kinds of maps. They're generally updated every four months. All of, of Gaza right, is considered to be in um, the emergency phase, and significant portions, about 500,000 people, are in phase five, which is catastrophe. You will note that the international community estimates that there is no one in category one, in other words, no one who does not need food assistance on the ground in, in Gaza. Um, there needs to be some sort of way to get additional humanitarian aid in, um, but it just simply has not been happening. Um, prior to October 7th, about 500 trucks a day one were bringing food and other goods into the Gaza Strip. We have not come anywhere close to 500 trucks a day since that, um, since that happened. It, um, the uh, chart on the top there, you can see that um, it's showing which missions were able to be um, facilitated. The ones that the Israelis um, cooperated with and were actually able to go through, those are the blue ones at the bottom. Everything above that was a humanitarian aid mission that had some sort of complication and probably was not able to be completed. Right? Um, there just are not uh, enough trucks that are getting into um, to the Gaza Strip. The World Food Program, in its most recent analysis, said that the number of people that have been reached with food aid was significantly below the usual number reached by the World Food Program because of Israeli-imposed bureaucratic hurdles, a lack of security guarantees within Gaza, insufficient border crossing points, and the risk of criminal gangs looting humanitarian convoys in southern Gaza. Forced population movements have also disrupted capacity of partners to maintain operations and distribute food. The situation on the ground is dire um, and is likely to get worse because there are long-term consequences to people not having enough food to eat. For example, we've just recently seen a case of polio um, in Gaza. Now there's a desperate attempt to get inoculations in there to try to prevent that from, from spreading. This is putting enormous pressure on the Biden administration, again, internationally, but also domestically, right? This is where the uncommitted vote um, effort started during the primaries, where you had uh, large numbers of Democratic voters who were not willing, and this was when Biden was still on the ticket, obviously, were not willing to vote for, for Biden. But there are significant questions about whether or not the Arab and Muslim population in Michigan will be willing to vote for the Democratic ticket. So this could have spillover impact on the um, U.S. presidential election. Um, and then lastly, um, in terms of the tensions between Israel and the United States, part of it is that Israel has repeatedly rebuffed the United States for example, the U.S. and France were publicly um, presenting a ceasefire um, plan for Lebanon. The Israelis assassinated the leader of Hezbollah, Hassan Nasrallah, about a day after this was actually done. The Americans didn't get any advanced warning. They considered it to be a slap in the face um, by Netanyahu. I mean, it is very clear at this point that Biden and um, Netanyahu do not get along with one another. It, the U.S. really wants, obviously, to avoid a wider war in, in the Middle East. Um, it actually helped deconflict the situation in April um, between Israel and Iran. So in, on April 1st, um, Israel actually bombed the uh, Iranian consulate in Damascus, killed eight to 11 people, um, including some very high-ranking members of the um, Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps. In retaliation, Israel or um, Iran launched that major missile attack in, in April. Iron Dome, Arrow, David's Arrow, et cetera, those were able to ensure there was one casualty. Um, a, a young girl was hit with shrapnel. Um, it could have either been from the missile or from the um, 
the missile that shot the missile down. But in any case, Iron Dome and the other technological advances have meant that Israel um, can withstand these kinds of barrages without risking large numbers of, um, of casualties. Then you had the assassination of um, Ishmael Hanea in Tehran in July 31st. Um, he was the civilian leader of Hamas outside of uh, the region. The pager bombers that happened um, in Beirut and then the killing of Hassan Nasrallah in, um, in Beirut on September 27th. All of these um, uh, things with Lebanon have meant that um, the war is escalating in Lebanon, actually, e even as we speak. It, so there are about 60,000 Israelis who live in the, um, the northern part. So you can see um, on the map here, right, all along the border, right, these people have been forced to evacuate their homes because of missiles that are coming in from, from Hezbollah. Right? Although I have also um, seen some reporting that coming from that area that uh, says that the local population wasn't leaving because of the missiles, but because they were afraid of a Hezbollah ground attack similar to what Hamas had done um, on October 7th. Right? So this is part of the domestic pressure that Netanyahu's administration is facing. They want those people to be able to go home and to be safe. I would note this is why Israel occupied southern Lebanon from 1985 until 2000 was to attempt to keep Hezbollah far enough from the border that people in northern Israel did not have to um, routinely seek shelter um, from Hezbollah um, missile and bombing attacks. But you can see, so this, the map over there is from, um, is from October 2nd. It, um, oops, I'll keep... Sorry, I keep forgetting which one is the. All right. So this area here is sort of you can sort of see it's cross hatched. Okay, that was where the Israelis um, occupied, but it is also now um, where. Um, UNIFIL, which is the UN interim force in Lebanon. So there is a UN. Um, peacekeeping force, but it's of the lightly armed, they're only supposed to keep the two sides apart from one another kind of peacekeeping operation. But they are in that area. Nonetheless, it's obviously, um, you've had substantial um, strikes by um, Israel into Lebanon, and actually the strikes are climbing um, further north as Israel goes after Hezbollah. Right? With the pager attack, um, the assassination of Nasrallah. The Israelis said today that they had killed um, the person that many people thought was likely to succeed um, Nasrallah. They obviously see that Hezbollah is um, uh, dramatically weakened, and so they are going um, after them. You can see the uh, areas. It is all along the border on both sides um, where these uh, conflicts have been taking place in, in Lebanon. So the red dots um, are areas of where the Israelis have attacked. And so you can see that actually it's not just in southern Lebanon that it has been spreading up the um, uh, um, up through all of, um, of Lebanon. Unfortunately, um, even though this fighting has only been happening for a very short period of time, the humanitarian situation in Lebanon is now um, also um, very bad. There have been about 1,700 deaths that have been reported in Lebanon. Um, well over half a million people have been internally displaced. Um, according to the, um, the UN and humanitarian agencies in Lebanon, of the 892 collective shelters that are available for internally displaced persons, 677 of them are already full. Um, and then, irony of ironies, 185,000 Lebanese have gone into Syria as refugees, right? Because a huge number of Syrians crossed into Lebanon during the height of the, um, of the Syrian civil war, right? So we have um, significant issues with Lebanon. Are the Israelis going to launch a full-scale ground invasion? They just put a fourth division into that. But again, the Israelis have gone into Lebanon in the past with ground forces and 
ultimately it has not gone well, right? Hezbollah are effective fighters. They are deeply entrenched. The population in southern Lebanon um, is very anti-Israel and are likely to fight strongly against them, right? The Israelis could be taking casualties in Lebanon in a way they probably were not going to take casualties in, in Hamas. Um, and then the other piece um, that we now have to worry about because of the attacks, um, the missile attacks by Iran uh, earlier uh, in the month, is Israel going to attack Iran? Now, the Biden administration clearly does not want this to happen. It, um, there are multiple sets of targets that people have been talking about. One is you hit Iran's oil um, facilities, right? in particular, yeah, make sure I get the right thing. Yeah, um, uh, it's major export terminal at um, at Karg Island. So um, Biden has suggested the Israelis should not do that. Um, Iran is responsible for about two percent of the world's global oil supply at about two million barrels a, a day. Um, it's unlikely you could knock Iran completely um, off um, of its production, but it the fear of what an attack on Iran could mean could be driving the price of oil up um, significantly. The other question is, will Netanyahu decide that now is the time um, to strike Iran's nuclear facilities? Iran has wanted to do this um, for a long time. Uh, some of you might remember in 2000 and 11, 2012, there were very public discussions in the United States about whether or not, not just, not just Israel, but Israel and the United States should bomb Iran's nuclear facilities. Um, it is apparent that Netanyahu in the past has, has very much wanted to do so, but did not have US support for that. One of the reasons why they have held off in the past is because of fears of what Hezbollah would do, right? So if they attack Iran's nuclear facilities, would Hezbollah massive missile attacks? Hezbollah could even launch some sort of ground attack. Now that seems really unlikely, right? Hezbollah is not in much of a position to inflict the kind of damage on Israel that used to keep the Israelis from attacking in Tehran. So this is a major concern. I mean, the, Netanyahu may think that this is a, and you do hear this talk in Israel, that this might be a once in a lifetime chance, all right, to take out um, or to attack Iran's nuclear facilities. As people have pointed out, you can't bomb knowledge, uh, and the Iranians already have the knowledge of how to build the bomb, so you might be able to set them back, um, but you're not going to prevent them from doing this. I'd also note, in 1981, the Israelis took the opportunity of the Iran-Iraq war to bomb the Osirik nuclear reactor in Iraq. And as we later learned, the Iraqis at that point were not planning to develop a nuclear weapon. But after the attack, Saddam Hussein said, full steam ahead, we have to be able to protect ourselves against an Israeli attack. Um, so there can be unforeseen consequences from, uh, from this kind of thing. So I will wrap up. Um, you, know, you know, the U.S. actually has potentially leverage that it could use against the Israelis to get them to change their behavior. Um, we're by far their major backer. There really isn't anywhere else the Israelis um, can go to get their weapons. But I would note that patrons like the United States have leverage over their clients when there are no domestic obstacles, right? Um, to manipulating the level of aid to pressure the client to comply. That is obviously not true in the United States. There are huge domestic obstacles to trying to um, cut off any kind of aid to military aid to the Israelis. Another way in which patrons can have um, leverage is when the client is not willing to risk losing the support of their patron. And in this case, you would think that was true because Israel is so reliant on the US. Um, so they're not willing to risk losing their support to pursue a particular aim. And that also clearly doesn't obtain in this case. Netanyahu and Israel clearly see what is happening as an existential threat. And they're going to keep fighting whether the United States cuts off its assistance or, um, or not. And, and lastly, 
it's an election year, and there is nothing to be gained by um, the administration in attempting to confront Israel at, at this point. Um, so I think it is unlikely that the United States is going to be able to change Israel's calculus in terms of what it is planning to do in um, Lebanon or with respect to Iran and ultimately what it is going to do with, with Gaza. But the United States is going to be part of this no matter how this conflict unfolds, um, both in terms of um, if there is a wider war and then in terms of, of having to pick up the pieces after the fighting is, um, is over. So um, I'd be happy to take any questions, um, comments, et cetera, that, um, that anybody has. Professor, several questions. What's the, what's the difference between Hezbollah and Hamas? It's a very interesting question. All right, so um, Hezbollah is um, a predominantly Shia organization, right, representing the Shia population in Lebanon, and Hamas is a Sunni um, organization. They're both fundamentalists, but of different sects. Iran has a much closer relationship with Hezbollah, and Hezbollah is very dependent on the Iranians in ways that Hamas was not. Um, in fact, there are reports that um, Hezbollah was really irritated um, with Hamas, that it did not give it a heads up about October 7th, because Hezbollah felt like, well, now we've got to do something. We can't not do anything. Um, and they were not looking for um, an escalation with the, with the Israelis. So the likelihood is the Iranians have more influence and sway over Hezbollah than they have over um, Hamas. Both Hezbollah and Hamas are more than just, um, so they are widely considered terrorist organizations. They both use terrorism as a tactic, but both of them are much more beyond that. Um, Hezbollah um, is a very well-developed organization. It's got a social services side. It has integrated itself into the Lebanese political system. It has had cabinet officials. It, um, Hamas, of course, also has uh, those kinds of social programs and was actually running the government of, of Gaza. So they're more than just simply armed movements both of them. Um, but that, of course, is the, um, is the primary uh, focus um, for the Israelis and for the, and for the Americans. If I heard you correctly, and I would agree, um, as far as humanitarian efforts, international law, the United States is viola violating the rules of the Geneva Convention they ratified in 1949. There's no such thing as Geneva Conventions because it's not a declared war. No, um, there is, um, there are, so there, you can have an interstate war, which actually is what this has been um, considered between Hamas and Israel. So the full protections of the Geneva Conventions apply. Even if it was considered a civil war when there are fewer um, protections, there's still common Article 3. Right? But international humanitarian law um, also says that you must discriminate between combatants and non-combatants, right? Um, and it, your strikes have to be proportional. So civilians will get killed in war. There's no way that can be avoided. But you are supposed to balance the number of civilians who are killed against the military objective you are seeking to achieve. There should be proportionality there. Um, and that is where um, Israel um, traditionally, both on discrimination and proportion, has come under um, a lot of uh, scrutiny from international lawyers, et cetera. Um, so there, I mean, there are all sorts of specific areas where you could um, show that Israel is likely in violation of international humanitarian law. Obviously, Hamas's attack on October 7th was a war crime and a crime against humanity. Um, there's, I mean, there's no, there's no doubt both sides are engaging in this. I would note the United States, its own laws say the U.S. is not supposed to provide military assistance to a country that it 
um, has, uh, that it believes is using US weapons to violate international humanitarian law. And earlier this year, um, USAID and the State Department's Bureau of Refugees both independently told the administration that they believed that um, Israel was in violation of this law, and they did. They said the administration should halt military aid. Um, they were overridden by that. It's one of the reasons why we have seen some people um, in the State Department and USAID who have actually resigned over policy differences. Um, so there's, a, there's reason to believe under US law um, that the US should not be providing weapons to Israel if there's credible evidence that it is violating international humanitarian law. One, just one more. Um, what, never give up the mic. <laughs> yes. What are the Abraham Accords and are they effective? Thank you. Thank you. So the Abraham Accords were the effort um, by the Trump administration to normalize relations between Israel and Arab countries. And so they got um, Morocco, Bahrain, and the United Arab Emirates um, to normalize their ties with Israel. So there's a very lengthy article in the, um, in the Atlantic today, which I haven't been able to read because I don't have a subscription. I'm going to remedy um, reading this. But I did read a transcript of an interview with the person that wrote this article. Anyway, um, one of the things that, um, that he is reporting is that in the days before October 7th, the Biden administration actually thought that they were very close to getting Saudi Arabia to agree to a normalization with the Israelis, right? That, that's the big thing that the administration, they wanted to further the Abraham Accords and it had to be Saudi Arabia, that was the key piece. Um, but there needed to be some way to show that there would be progress towards um, a Palestinian state. I, I, I mean, even just a little progress, the Saudis would need some kind of, um, of fig leaf to be able to sign this accord. Um, but apparently, the administration believed that they were very, very close um, in doing that because then you could have Saudi Arabia and Iran, or um, Israel, whose biggest enemy is both Iran in an alliance with one another. It would be um, a, a great way to um, contain Iranian um, uh, misbehavior in the in the regime or in the region, but there's also reason to believe that this is why Hamas attacked. That Hamas was aware that the Palestinian issue was being decentered from the international agenda, and they feared that if that went through, they would never be able um, to advance their political um, ambitions, uh, and so they they attacked with the idea that they could. Um, Event, an Israeli Saudi agreement. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you. Seems like there's a lot of pressure put on Israel to stop the war. Why is there no pressure put on, on uh, Hamas? Why is there no pressure for them to stop hiding among civilians, which is a war crime? Why is there no pressure on them to change their charter, which includes the idea of the total elimination of Israel? Why is there no pressure on them to just, re just, re just surrender and give up and stop the, the torture of their people? So the United States does not have any leverage whatsoever over Hamas. But we can still I mean, pressure them. In what, in what way? I mean, there's certainly, re certainly rhetorically, there is plenty of, um, I mean, no one is saying that um, what Hamas did on um, October 7th wasn't, I mean, you may have people on the extremes, but I mean, in the administration, you're not gonna find somebody who's gonna tell you that what happened on October 7th, right, wasn't a crime against humanity. It wasn't um, a terrible blow against Israeli security, right? Um, but the United States is not in a position to really um, put pressure on Hamas. We can't turn the screws on them other than what we're already doing, which the administration um, has actually um, put more sanctions in place against the Iranians to try to prevent any kind of money from getting from Tehran to, um, to Hamas, right? The US has been working behind the scenes with the Iranians and with um, Hezbollah, again, in this notion of, of de-conflicting between Israel and Iran. So 
The United States said to the Israelis, you know, the, Iran, the Israelis attacked in Damascus. Iran retaliated with a very well telegraphed missile strike, which none of them hit anything in, in Israel. And then the United States was able to say to the Israelis, take the win. Don't, don't do anything else. Like, nobody got hurt. There's almost no damage on the ground. Iran looks ridiculous, right? It launched 300 missiles. It did nothing. Um, but, you know, for the United States, there isn't any way other than continuing negotiations with Hamas to get a ceasefire, right? And then once a ceasefire in place, the other things might be possible to ensure, for example, that Hamas is not permitted to retake political power um, in, in Gaza. It, Hamas has to be destroyed. Hamas is an ideology as much as it is an organization. But and we, we were able to be successful after World War II with the utter destruction of Germany, and we destroyed the Nazism pretty much. We had a god running Japan, and when he saw the power that was greater than what his, he could inflict, those people accepted defeat. And in my opinion, this is not a war going on right now we've seen for the past year. This is another battle in the war of Israeli statehood very similar to the Hundred Years' War in the 14th and 15th century. These are just flare-ups on the continual conflict, and it wasn't until the English kings accepted that they did not, could not exert their influence over the French kingdom because of the marriage of the daughter of the King of France way back in 1340, and they have to accept defeat, or it'll go on forever. How many more people have to get killed in, in Gaza? Ask the losers. Ask the losers. So. They're losing. This is the same kind of thinking, right, that allowed Hamas to go into Israel and do what it did on October 7th. Because from Hamas's perspective, there was no difference between an ordinary Israeli citizen and the Israeli defense forces, which are responsible for the immiseration of the Gaza Strip in their eyes. This is the same thing. These are ordinary people who are in Gaza who are trapped. They can't get out of Gaza. They have no ability to get rid of Hamas. What, I mean, what is going to happen to them? Why, why is it that none of the other Arab states would take uh, refugees from Gaza? Because they knew the Israelis would not allow them to come back. The majority of the population of Gaza are refugees from 1948. They are people whose original homes are in what is now the state of Israel. And Israel made a decision in July of 1948 that it would not allow any refugees to leave. And then it extended its military campaigns and ethnically cleansed portions of Palestine. So they're not, no one is going to, um, you know, the Egyptians certainly were not going to take the entire population of Gaza, it's 2.1 million people, because they knew the Israelis would not allow them to go back. It is also, the Sinai Peninsula um, is not capable of sustaining a huge number of people in refugee camps. Um, and in any case, even if you let all 2.1 million people, 2.2 million people into the Sinai Peninsula, you put them in refugee camps, 30 years from now, they are still gonna be there. That does not, again, that does not solve the underlying political dynamics of this situation. And Israel is responsible in some ways for refusing to come to some kind of political solution. It gets harder and harder every year we move past 1967, right? But Palestinians as ordinary people are not responsible for what Hamas did. And so we should take more care with their lives. But they voted for Hamas. They voted for power. So that also is really, is much more complicated than that. A lot of the reason that um, people voted for Hamas in 2006 was because the Palestinian Authority was viewed as corrupt and Hamas was not. Because Hamas provided social services, the Palestinian Authority did not. Um, and so Hamas ran in 2006. It wasn't sure it wanted to do that because it, it felt like it was polluting its movement, right, by engaging in Palestinian politics that way. But it did anyway. It did not think it was going to win. 
right? And so then it was in a situation where, uh uh-oh, now we have to form the government. And they wanted a coalition government with Fatah, but Fatah, with the US and Israeli support, said no. They made Hamas take control themselves, and then that ultimately, I mean, there is a US and an Israeli fingerprint on the war between Fatah and, and Hamas, right? But I would also just say, just because Americans vote for a political leader, does that mean we should all then be killed if that political leader chooses to do something that we don't like? I mean, there has to be um, a division that is made between Palestinians as a people and as people, just ordinary people, and Hamas. They are not the same thing. Right? And that election was in 2006. 50%, at least, of the population of Gaza is under the age of 15. Those kids did not vote for Hamas. Right? They had nothing to say about this. But at least 11,000 children have been killed in Gaza. And many of them have been maimed. Right? And I just, again, think the Gaza Strip has been utterly destroyed. What happens to those two million people when this fighting is over? They're not going anywhere, but something is going to have to be done um, to solve that problem. And there is, there's, there's no sign that Netanyahu has any kind of answer for that. Like, what? literally, let's say Hamas is totally destroyed. Every last member of Hamas is, is killed, which is not possible. Then what happens? And that's part of the tension between Biden and, 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 and Israel is that um, Netanyahu is not planning for the day after. It's all been about now. I mean, I, 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 I understand your frustration and, and your anger, um, but I, I also think that, this, that um, we all need to try to hold on to the shreds of humanity that, that, are, that are left. Right? Um, just like the people in Lebanon, many of them are furious with Hezbollah. They're kind of like, why are we being bombed? We're, we had nothing to do with this. Why are we the ones that are now in the order of this? Thank you, Doctor. Well, Thank you, Beth. Do- eight o'clock. This man has a great, some great points. You talk about political solutions. Doesn't it all come down to, from the very beginning, two world religions yes. can't live together? Yes. No. Yes. Thank you, Beth, mm-hmm. for a very interesting yeah. mm-hmm. discussion. Mm-hmm. Thank you to all of you for coming. Mm-hmm. Thank you.